Yeah, let's start here with a little tech time. Let's get this out of the way and then uh, chapter 7, part 1. Um, having gone through the, the syllabus, when I did this, when I found out about the cohort system, I divided it up like we've been doing. But <clears throat> come to find out, when I look closer at this kind of midsection, as we get into the midterm, it didn't flow right. And so that's why this update went out, and you can see it in the announcements. It was an email as well. <clears throat> so for you guys, Cohort A, we'll get Chapter 7, Part 2 in class, and then do this, a presentation writing workshop, where we're going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> putting together a presentation so that you can do it for the class, and some tips on writing, just basic outlining ideas, how to do citations and references, either APA, MLA, depending on what the school uses. So some time on that, and then the second half of that day will be team time. So we'll figure out what the teams are, two, three, four students sign up for one of the topics in the syllabus, and then some time on the computer to start putting some ideas down to work on that outline. And I'll, I'll move around and, and help folks out uh, as we do it. It's not completely, you know, throw it at you, good luck, hope you don't screw it up. So we'll do that. For you guys, Chapter 8 will be an all, it's not, it's a transition from kind of the Revolution Constitution into the movement towards Civil War, so it's not going to be a super long video, but that will be video for you guys, and that will conclude all that's going to be on the midterm. So the midterm is up to that point, so Chapters 1 through 8, don't worry about the rest of it, you know, 9 through 15 will be included on the final, but we'll get there. So do watch this one, and when it's time for the midterm, the Constitution worksheets still do at the same point, February 2nd. Uh, the midterm will be online, probably 45-ish questions, mostly true-false, multiple choice, but some uh, short answer. I may throw in an essay, uh, but I'll double the time to 120 minutes. So even when I do this in class, uh, the paper copy version, I've seen 35, 45 minutes. Somewhere in there is what it normally takes people. So you'll have ample time. It won't be a rush. But in, you know, taking the quizzes, taking the midterm, have available your notes, the uh, glossary, and, you know, know which chapters cover what material. You can have the slides open, or if you're not sure, open one of them up and use that find function and search for it. Right? So um, online tends to take a little bit longer, hence a two-hour uh, window to take it. And again, same thing, three days. It'll be open on the 4th as we finish up Chapter 8. And then this, don't worry about, because that'll be the other cohort. I wanted to give them the same opportunity. So that's why I modified this section of the syllabus. And then we'll pick up uh, Chapter 9, Parts 1 and 2, divide them up, and then we'll be back on the normal flow per what the syllabus says. All right, so... That's why the change, it just didn't, I didn't catch it the first time I modified this, so that's why. Um, another piece, just because <clears throat> we, I use this in the video. This is a link to, and you can look at constitution.congress.gov. It's the government website, but it's an actual searchable constitution. And it steps you through, you know, the preamble, the three articles that deal with legislative, executive, and judicial in that order and what they do, what their jobs are, um, right? And we'll cover that in class. But there's sections like Section 8, here's what you guys are responsible for. Section 9, here's what you don't do, right? So there's some, here's what you do, here's what you can't do pieces of the Constitution. So this is kind of useful. And then I may bring this one up, I don't know, uh, just to look at. It's the Citizens Against Government Waste website. And it talks about, you know, there's bills that go to the president to be signed into law or not. Um, but oftentimes a bill like the defense spending bill, which authorizes the year-long budget for the military, both equipment and paying soldiers, etc., that one invariably gets signed into law because we don't want to have the military with no money. But what happens is some congressmen tend to, congresswomen as well, tend to stick in little lines into that big bill that have nothing to do with the defense of the country. It's more about their constituents or trying to get money for a project back home. And some of that, it's called pork barrel politics because a lot of money gets wasted in the process of doing that. So that's it for tech time, mainly on the, uh, the change here. And don't forget about your uh, midterm being online. And I'll remind you guys again. So <clears throat> let's jump into your part, Chapter 7, Part 1. 
the part two is a little bit longer, more involved, but on the good side, I guess we get to cover that in class where I had to do the video for cohort B. So kind of a little review going through this idea. The Colonials resisted Acts, the Sugar Acts, Stamp Act, Townsend Acts, the series of, and, and why. Well, it was two parts. One being they were being taxed. That's what these laws were. They had to do with tax money. They were being taxed without any representation in the parliament. So that was making them mad. Taxation without representation is tyranny, was the full sentence. And the other piece was if they violated one of these laws, they um, were tried, if you can call it that, in what was known as a vice admiralty court. It was a military court with a single judge who was loyal to the crown. So they did not get the trial by jury. So in a sense, they were complaining about the lack of rights that British citizens living in England had. They had representation through Parliament. They had a trial by jury if they did something wrong. And so that's what pushes us to war, is the kind of that back and forth. The colonials resist, the Crown comes back with more acts, or more resistance to, or the things called the intolerable acts, that we're gonna, we're gonna close Boston Harbor and uh, move the trial of the soldiers from the Boston Massacre out of Boston, right? Key battles of the war. And I think <clears throat> for this one, you guys, this was part of your video. So again, why the review? Any war, when you look at it, you have the opening battle or battles and the culminating battle, the, the victory or loss. Those are always significant. And then there's always somewhere in the middle a turning point. So let's just step through them. The four key battles. Starting the war, Lexington and Concord, right, happened on the same day, April 1775. Shots fired at Lexington. The British moved toward Concord. They're stopped at Concord Bridge. Remember, they were going to try to round up the leaders of this revolutionary movement and then back into Boston where they're being shot at all the way. So that starts. Blood has been shed. It's, it may be impossible at this point to uh, compromise, reconcile, stop the war. Now we move into... Uh, 1775 wasn't a horrible year for the revolution, right? Lexington Concord, uh, it wasn't a victory, but they did okay at Bunker Hill. Um, uh, General Knox gets some, takes Fort Ticonderoga and captures some British equipment. So that's not bad, but as we go through 1776, it's not good. Uh, kind of the only good thing was the declaration coming out. <clears throat> As we get to the end of 1776, the winter of moving into 77, that's where the second key battles, plural, kind of like Lexington Concord, the Battle of Trenton, and then the follow-on battle at Princeton. Trenton's significant because things had been going badly. So Washington makes a bold decision to try to surprise the Hessians, the um, mercenaries hired by the British and he crosses the Delaware River on the night of Christmas when it's cold it's full of ice this is a daring plan but the hope is to surprise catch the Hessians asleep and it works and so is it militarily huge not really I mean it's not the turning point of the war but what it does both um, uh, Trenton and Princeton is it boosts the morale of the country and the soldiers, maybe more importantly. Because when things are going bad, you need a victory to kind of turn it around. And so Trenton does that. So that's significant. Then we move to the actual turning point of the war, and that's that next bullet, the fill in the blank, the Battle of Saratoga. And it was significant in several respects. One, the British failed to execute their concentration in time, three-pronged attack. Right? Only Burgoyne's prong made it. Uh, St. Ledger was turned around, and then Howe just stayed down in Philadelphia for the winter. Right? That's where the food and the beer was. Uh, and so the Colonials come, the Continental Army comes up with a stunning victory, captures an English army, holy mackerel, and even perhaps more significantly, the French who had been watching from the sidelines thinking, yeah, we like supporting the Americans, we hate the English. That victory was significant enough where the French go, you know what, these crazy guys might actually pull this off. And so the French join on the side of the uh, Continental Army, which is going to provide manpower, expertise, and a navy. And so we see that, and that goes to the last of the four, the key battle. The Battle of Yorktown, where Washington and elements of the French Army surround uh, Cornwallis 
at Yorktown and is cut off to the sea because he was waiting to be evacuated and moved somewhere else, not even evacuated, um, just picked up and moved by the Navy, the British Navy. He's trapped because the French Navy takes that um, part of the York River. So he has no way of escaping and he has to surrender. And at that point, the British, it's not like the British could have not continued to fight. They still have the strongest Navy and military, but they were war weary. They were fed up with fighting. And so that goes to the strategy of the Continental Army, win by not losing. Keep fighting, keep your army intact, at least viable as far as an army goes, and maybe the British will get tired of fighting. And it works, right? And that's maybe Washington's biggest piece was keeping the effort alive over those dark periods, which there was quite a few of. Whereas the British strategy, I mean, you look at it, they kind of got it wrong, and it proves in the end to be their demise. They were more keen on capturing big cities, relatively speaking, back then, but, you know, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, those areas. But taking those cities doesn't really get you any closer to victory. Maybe eventually it will, but had they uh, decided to attack and destroy the Continental Army, then they could have won the war. But since they didn't do that, the Continental Army was able to stay alive and pick at them, right? Um, Guerrilla warfare. And so the Continental Army strategy ends up working. The British got it wrong. And then two parts to the Declaration. A few of you got this wrong on the quiz, and it wasn't supposed to be tricky. But if you look at it, there's that beginning eloquent call to human rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, all men created equal. It's that aspirational statement of what the country's going to be if we win the war. But the second, really two thirds, is a complaint list. He did this, he did that, he did this, he did that. It's at the king and showing, here's why we're going to war. It's not some whim, it's that the king won't listen. He won't, no, no representation, uh, no trial by jury. And so that second portion is a list of complaints and it puts it out to the whole world to see that we're not just doing this just because. Uh, we may not like the king, but it's a matter of these are the accusations and so the rest of the world including the French look at it and go hmm, maybe if I was in that position I'd do the same thing all right so here is the uh, the painting of Cornwallis surrendering at Yorktown so holy moly we pulled it off against the longest of odds the Continental Army wins and George Washington if you looked at like the, the turning point of the war Saratoga you had uh, who Gates and Benedict Arnold were the commanders Washington wasn't part of that but he was able to keep the effort and the army and everything intact and so after the war people start looking to him as the father of our country because of his strong ethical compass um, his communication skills that he's a well-respected well-loved leader and so he becomes really a natural choice to be the first president and he's picked to do that. There's no real election associated with it. So Treaty of Paris, every war comes to an end. Treaty of wherever the treaty is signed, um, uh, the British choose to stop fighting. They could have continued, but war weariness, and they had other issues around the globe, so they choose to stop. Now they're gonna reconsider that position as we move into the 1800s, right? The War of 1812 is a sort of quasi attempt to regain the colonies but it doesn't really work. And so now with the land that was um, taken in the French and Indian War by the British, now the British are defeated. So America really is from the ocean to the Mississippi River as far as land. Now, none of that area, some of it's claimed by other states, but we don't have the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, some of that Western Reserve area yet. So those are gonna form up after the fact. And now the 13 colonies become the 13 states. And so we've got to put together some kind of, we won the war, Oof, that was hard enough, but now we got to figure out, okay, how are we going to govern this new country, the United States of America, the 13 states? Okay. And so I talked about this a little bit, George Washington, um, I don't know, not hugely successful, maybe that's a little bit unfair, but the ability to keep the fighting spirit and the morale alive, a man of integrity, a man of dignity, so much so Washington's first two terms as president, which he didn't even want to do the second, they begged him to do it, really sets the standard, the precedent for those that follow. There was nothing in the Constitution back then that said two terms as president. That's a later phenomenon, the 22nd Amendment after FDR, who's elected four times. 
But because he did two, everybody else said, well, good enough for Washington, good enough for me. Um, not his excellency, not your highness, Mr. President. That was his idea. We don't want any of this title monarchy BS. Okay? And so now it's time to, the declaration is aspirational. Here's what we want to try to do. Uh, now we got to try to put it in action. And when it comes to the founders, and I may have mentioned this in class on a video, there is some kind of thought out there, you know, it's been for a while that the founders, you know, they were bad, they were racist, there's a lot of them had slaves. Don't move them into the present and judge them by current standards because the, the country was different. And even you look at Jefferson, he struggled with the idea of slavery. Um, they were people of their time, men and women of their time. And some were more enlightened or more contemporary or more progressive than others. Um, but even with Lincoln, you move him into today's world and he would be judged much more harshly, even though he's known as the great emancipator. Okay? So time to put those ideals, that mark on the wall. That's what they did. They said, here's what we want to be in 100, 200, 300 years, that the country to form a more perfect union. We're going to see that phrase again. So we're looking at the first half, 7172, right? Common sense. Um, kind of that reference to Thomas Paine's article, we're moving from a monarchy to now a republic where we, the people, are the source of power, all the way back to the uh, uh, Mayflower Compact and how much change. And then 7374, the second half of Chapter 7, we'll do in class, which is really looking at the Constitution. So before, what do we have? We have the Declaration. We have some ideas out there, liberty, equality, individual rights. And that second half, right, that's kind of crass, but the king sucks. He did this, he did this, why we're going to war. So think about it, the declaration uh, released, you know, officially on uh, July 4th, 1776. Did that make the United States a free country? The answer is no, right? We were just at the very beginnings of a war that started in 75 and went to 1781. The thing it did do was it put all those who signed its life on the line. Because if we'd have lost, they'd have been tried for treason against the crown. Or maybe one of those. So that's what it does. It says we're breaking bands with England. But to make it mean anything, we have to win the Revolutionary War. Otherwise, they're all hanging by their necks and the Declaration's hanging in Parliament so they could laugh at it. In that are some of these ideas that we've taken from... Enlightenment authors like John Locke, like Thomas Hobbes, Life, Liberty, Property. We stole that almost entirely and changed it to Pursuit of Happiness. And this idea that government has responsibility, that the government's responsible for protection of us, the citizens, and in turn, we don't do absolutely everything we want. We surrender some of our rights and liberties to the government. So it's a, a contract. We're working together on this idea. Right? And Jefferson being the author, the primary author of the idea all men are created equal. Again, hypocritical perhaps, but it's a it's a mark on the wall. We want to get there. And he goes back to the Mayflower Compact. Consent of the governed. We the people. We run this country, at least theoretically. So here's a picture of a few of these big brain thinkers. Notice uh, Locke <laughs> with the flowing locks. Right? Handsome fella. You've got Hobbes. And again, I may have mentioned this in a previous video, there is a little overlap sometimes. But notice too, John Stuart Mill, this is actually a picture of, and he wrote the book On Liberty. Hobbes wrote The Leviathan, John Locke, Two Treaties on Government. Mill is a later entry into this list, but he comes up with a concept that's kind of critical to how we think of our liberties and, and freedoms in America, the idea of a harm concept, that I can do what I want, up until the point that it starts harming you or other people. So... A silly example maybe I'm gonna watch the Super Bowl have a few beers that's cool but don't get behind the wheel after you've done that because now you put other people in harm's way in jeopardy that's his idea of the harm clause so these key concepts <clears throat> the Leviathan by Hobbes it's a uh, it's a book the Leviathan itself is the government that's what he's talking about right and Locke wrote about this as well the social compact the, the um, contract between us and our governments that we work together desire for protection which entails surrender of some personal liberties we can't do absolutely everything because it would be chaos this one's a little bit more difficult the idea of pluralism 
and it has to do with yes we're majority rule in a democracy but it's not like majority rule and thus trample all minority rights because the idea is this our country should be in the interest of all of us and now we go to vote for governor of Georgia whoever gets the most votes wins but in other cases things like um, laws Supreme Court decisions you'll see a majority and a minority opinion and oftentimes there'll be a caveat in there that we don't want to trample minority rule and in this case minority not like ethnic or racial minority but minority as far as belief in rule X whatever it might be okay. and then I just mentioned this the harm concept that my freedoms extend until they start harming other people can I drive 150 down the interstate? I can do it, but I put other people in danger, thus there's speed limits and laws about that. And I'll find my butt in jail and my car confiscated if I do it. Right? And so that's why Mill is an important piece. And these, all of these should help you with the um, Constitution worksheet as well. Some of the pieces in there, the big brain thinkers that I mentioned. Okay, so before the Constitution, those ideas are floating around. Our, our founding fathers are very enlightened, very intellectual people. And so as the revolution's being fought, they actually think about, we need to have something in place. So hopefully if we win, we have some kind of governmental system in mind. And so the Articles of Confederation is the first attempt. Yes, it's actually adopted during the Revolutionary War. Um, the thing with the articles was it put all of the onus, all of the emphasis on states' rights. Uh, 13 individual colonies, soon to be states. But the problem is, one, there's only one branch of government, the Congress. And two, they don't have any ability to tax or really do much of anything. So it's sort of this loose affiliation of friendship between the states. And there's going to be an event that shows, boy, these just aren't going to work. So you could call them sort of inaccurately, I guess, the first draft of the Constitution. But what the articles really did was show what wouldn't work. So it gave us a starting point as to don't do this, what will work, which eventually leads us to the Constitution. Okay. Yep, Congress had almost no power and they were the only branch. A league of friendship, not a league of, not a way to have a nation. And guess what? The uh, Confederate States of America are going to run into much of the same thing during the Civil War. Now, they, they purposely did this. They didn't purposely mean to screw it up. This was, you know, the best we could think of at the time. But they wanted a deliberately weak form of government. They didn't want strong central government because that's what a monarchy is. That's what we're fighting the war against. And these are developed during the war itself. So we don't want to go down that road. We want we the people, at least to a degree, to have say in how things work. Again, back to the Mayflower Compact idea. Unregulated tariffs, because there were no regulations. There was no federal government per se. So you have different tariffs from different states, and that can just drive trade and monetary policy crazy. Now throw in the fact that after the war, each state starts printing its own money. We don't have U.S. currency, and it's like, ah, chaos. Oh, and the blue star on this? is a video i should have labeled it i didn't it's a video about the articles it's short it's about two to three minutes but it's really good at explaining why they failed and then the follow-on effort to, to start the constitution and this is maybe the turning point or the piece that really illustrates that man these articles aren't cutting it we need something different something better something more strong on the federal sense but still even with a stronger federal government we're not going to go the route of monarchy or a king so Shays Rebellion, Daniel Shays, he's a farmer, and he leads a group of farmers that are angry about foreclosures of their land from debts, and they rebel against the country at this point because the war's over. <clears throat> Guess what? They're pretty successful. And Congress is like, geez, we can't even raise an army. Excuse me. <coughs> We don't even have the power to raise an army to quell this rebellion of a bunch of farmers. Oy, 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 things are bad. And so what they have to do ultimately is they lean on the Massachusetts uh, regiment that fought in the Revolutionary War to put down this rebellion. But this illustrates, man, we, we got something. We got to do something different. Our national government's too weak. So weak in Congress, a revolution, Shays Rebellion. It's like, geez, the country's falling apart already. It's just like, like that. So that's what pushes them 
to start. And there was actually two. There was a meeting before the Constitutional Convention and then the actual convention in Philadelphia. Uh, and people slowly come in to try to address it. And uh, instead of modifying, which was the original idea, we're going to revise, modify the articles in the bin. And they started basically from scratch. But at least now they knew what wouldn't work. So we're not going to go down that road. So that, you know, the articles were helpful. Wow, this might be a record because part one is there's not a lot of teeth to it. Part two is the Constitution, which is a little bit longer. But as the country's growing, we have the articles. They're showing themselves not to be the greatest. But remember, um, this land is now part of the America, right? We've won the war. We got this from the French and Indian War vis-a-vis -vis the British, but now they're out. And so we're going to see eventually six states develop out of this uh, Western Reserve, as they call it, the Northwest Territories. And so what happens? Well, uh, they're not states yet, but they're soon to become states. So Ohio, you want to become a state. What do you have to do? Well, you have to put together a state constitution. You have to put together some form of state government because states are still very important. And then you petition the federal government to enter the union. And they do that. And each of these states is going to follow that. So part of um, what's adopted, at least, is this procedure from going from a territory to a state. And the important part of this is we're not going to have colonies. We're not going to have the 13 states and then the rest of you knuckleheads who come later. So Ohio, once you get all that done, you petition to enter the union. It's approved. You become a state on the same terms with Massachusetts or Georgia or South Carolina. So we don't have this kind of disparate, you know, the, the original and then the, the later folks. Everybody's the same. And that has to do with representation in the Congress as well. And that's going to be a big part of what we talk about in class next time. The other part of this is it was decided at this point. Um, it was either in the video, maybe we got to it in class, but there was that animated map that showed slavery in the original states right after the war and how the Northeast and New York, uh, Pennsylvania, how slavery died out in the northern side of the, the new states and how it migrated more to the south as the south became more uh, dependent on tobacco, cotton, um, labor-intensive agricultural products. When this came about, they said, you know what, all these states that come out of this Northwest Territory, we don't know how many it's going to be exactly, but four, five, six, whatever it is, all of them will be free. Free states. So that, it starts illustrating a split that's going to develop in the country. That split's going to be even more uh, visible during the Constitutional Convention because there's a give and take, a tug of war between slave and non-slave states and who has power as it gets back to that. So now we're saying that this whole section of the country will not have slavery, will be free. And we'll take that and move it forward through the Constitution all the way through 1820 and then the Civil War. And the last piece, just kind of a um, trivia perhaps, but if you've been to some of the towns and townships up in the north, uh, northern, uh, Northwest uh, Territories, right? The Western Reserve, as they called it. A lot of the cities look this rectangular setup, um, and they did it on purpose, right? The central section was reserved to help fund local schools. So they sold off tracts of land to try to get people to settle up there. And if you go up into the farm communities of Ohio, Indiana, things like that, it's all set up around kind of the town square, and the, the town evolves out from it like that. So that's why. Look at that. Right at about 30 minutes. Boy, that's probably the shortest one we'll ever have. But some key ideas in there. So that review piece uh, through the four battles of the war and the beginnings of getting us to a constitutional convention because the articles are just not up to it. Right? It's not good enough. All right. So I'll end it there. And then I will pick up seven part two. We'll probably look at these just quickly in class and then jump into the actual constitution itself which I know is riveting to everybody, but believe it or not, man, it is important to at least understand the concepts, the checks and balances idea, the branches of government. There's people in their 30s and 40s out there voting who can't even name the three branches of government. It's kind of pathetic. 
So knowing a little bit about how our country is supposed to work is important, especially if you don't like how things are going and you want to change it. All right? So I will see you guys on Monday. Hopefully it warms up a little bit. See you then.